This is the New England Journal of Medicine COVID-19 update for August 26, 2020. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the Journal, and I'm talking with Eric Rubin, Editor-in-Chief, and Lindsay Baden, Deputy Editor. Eric and Lindsay, over the past few weeks, we've talked a great deal about the prospects for vaccines and the relative merits of various vaccine candidates. In a perspective article published today, we learn more about the larger development ecosystem, at least from the vantage point of the U.S. government and Operation Warp Speed. Operation Warp Speed is an enormous project involving the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Defense, along with several private companies. So what's the strategy there? So the primary goal of Operation Warp Speed is to produce vaccines rapidly, far more rapidly than has ever been done with a vaccine in the past. The stated goal is approval or authorization of a vaccine or perhaps multiple vaccines by the end of this year and the ability to produce and deploy these vaccines by the middle of next year. So the authors cite in their perspective as a paradigm of that, the Ebola vaccine, where the development and approval occurred pretty rapidly, but much more slowly than this. So this is a much more substantial challenge. In the case of the Ebola vaccine, there was a lot of data available before the development process really started kicking into gear, where we have really very little preclinical data on these vaccine candidates. So there are several parts to this. Um, First, there's some direct funding of basic and applied research to bring clinical candidates forward into clinical trials. Then they are soliciting manufacturers willing to have their vaccines tested through a government-led effort, which is also completely funded by the government, and which has also established harmonized standards to allow different vaccines to be compared with one another. And importantly, the government is paying for the downstream development costs of the vaccines so that if they're approved, there will be the capacity to produce them rapidly. In other words, they're essentially buying vaccines that they don't know whether or not will work in advance. And all of this should accelerate production. This is a huge investment by the government, and they're paying for developing the vaccine itself and developing the processes and equipment and supplies and even paying for the physical facilities to produce vaccines. So this is an enormous program. I will say that given the events of this week, I think it's important to point out that the program is designed to get approval based on the kinds of data that we use to approve other sorts of drugs and vaccines and interventions in people. Now, we know as of this week with the convalescent plasma that the government has short-circuited those procedures and allowed emergency use of a reagent without the background data that we would ordinarily require of something that's being used in people. And that could be very problematic. But for now, the stated goal is this will get the sort of standard review, even if it's expedited, that other sorts of interventions do. So the program starts with testing. What's happening with that? And then what's the plan going forward from there? Well, we're deep into testing already because the first phase three trial is already started. And it's one of the mRNA vaccines that's being tested. It's already enrolling patients. But the plan is much larger than that. There are going to be a total of eight potential candidates. Along with the candidate that's currently in clinical trials, there's a second mRNA vaccine. There are two vaccines that use viral vectors to deliver antigens from the coronavirus. Uh, There are two subunit vaccines that are inactivated proteins from SARS-CoV-2 and two live attenuated vaccines. And in fact, the specific candidates have already been designated for the first three categories. We don't yet know what will fit into the fourth category. So those have not been designated yet. But there's been considerable progress in identifying candidates and starting to take them through. This is not so unusual. And there's a lot of big science that's done as public-private partnerships with the U.S. government. You can think about NASA, which has many contractors and where NASA collaborates with the contractors, but it entirely supports the cost of development and it de-risks the outcomes of that development. In biomedical research, the NIH already funds almost all of the basic research involved in developing therapeutics, 
and it's collaborated in several areas like in Zika and Ebola. Of course, the scale of this is much, much more substantial than any of those. So, Eric, you frame it very nicely. And as you know, I'm part of Operation Warp Speed and one of the phase three trials that has already launched. Two of them have launched with several more on the horizon. And the principle that you frame, which I think is critical, is how do we respond proportionately to a pandemic that has spread this quickly using all of our scientific knowledge and infrastructure to respond quickly, yet to do that safely with speed? And that's sort of what has come together here with elements of the government, industry, academia, community coming together and Operation Warp Speed really trying to catalyze that, but to do speed while not sacrificing safety. And then how do you do that, which is a part of the challenges? And I think you alluded to that in the sense of where do you take financial risks? And normally when we do drug development, vaccine development, it takes five to 10 years because things are done in series. There's a lot of contemplation between steps. And how does one telescope that? And I think, Steve, the perspective by Nikki Lurie about two months ago sort of helped frame this a little bit as well, where one can do the design, the preclinical, and the eye to manufacturing very quickly, and that is you know, money. Then phase one, two testing very quickly and rapidly plan phase three in an interlocked way that maintains full safety but takes financial risks by investing in several of the different pathways simultaneously. Even the scalability of manufacturing, Eric, that you were alluding to, is normally businesses won't manufacture hundreds of millions of doses until they have FDA approval, or at least the data upon which they would get FDA approval, which is typically the phase three data. Here, manufacturing to scale, and that's a debatable concept what scale is, and I'll come back to in a second, is being done up front because is it worth placing five couple of billion dollar bets for a multi-trillion dollar problem that saves you six to 12 months easily? And is that a good investment? And that's you know a, a decision we as society have to make, the government has to make. And I think part of Operation Warp Speed or OWS has been to make that decision. Let's manufacture to scale while we are doing the pivotal testing so that if any of these work, we can deploy shortly thereafter and not have to wait another months to years to have product available. But if it doesn't work, then you've manufactured hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars of product that you don't use. If it does work, you've saved six to 12 months or more, which as we look at our schools trying to open today and shutting down rapidly because of the rate of transmission, the value of additional countermeasures that can block transmission is substantial on so many levels, not just economic. The issue of scalability is not trivial because how do you make hundreds of millions of doses so everyone in the US can have access? But is that really our goal, hundreds of millions, or is it really 7 billion? Because as I hope we've learned with this epidemic, a uncontrolled infection in one part of the world or one part of the country or one part of your city or one part of your workplace puts everybody at risk in those environments and beyond. And so the scalability concept is not straightforward either if we really think about controlling this so that we can open society and get back to some form of normality. But I think Operation Warp Speed is facilitating concept design, preclinical testing, manufacturability with scalability, phase one, two testing that's interlinked right into phase three testing with plans to deliver to scale, which has so many elements as part of all of it. But it is a massive undertaking. It is a bit different than Ebola in that Ebola had more time and more clinical data to guide the discussion than we have in hand for COVID because COVID has only been around eight months. So anything we've thought about, it can't be more than eight months old, given the speed of the epidemic. So, so far, we've been talking mostly about the development of these potential vaccines. Eric, as you raised the concerns about the approval of convalescent plasma, 
What do you think the approval process for these vaccines is going to look like? I think it's very difficult, Steve, to second guess the federal government's actions right now. But there is a plan. The plan, if they stick with it, is to have the sort of standard process, but on an incredibly expedited schedule. The FDA is putting together advisory panels now that will evaluate the vaccines. They're trying to recruit a very large number of people for those so that at very short notice, they can assemble at least some quorum to pass judgment on a vaccine. And from there, it goes through the standard process of being evaluated by FDA staff, by an external advisory committee, and ultimately the commissioner makes the ruling. Whether or not the FDA will really stick with that, we'll see. I mean, I hope, as you say, Eric, that decision-making should be based upon the science and the data. We must generate the data as quickly as possible. It should be evaluated quickly, but it should use the standard processes the agency has to determine safety and efficacy. I am deeply concerned that if that process is not done and not done with transparency, albeit quite rapidly, as Eric, you suggest, the acceptability of the vaccine in our communities will be damaged. You know, there are many in our communities who are suspicious of vaccines and concerned about their use and potential side effects. And if we as a community do not develop these vaccines with the kind of data that the scientific and public health community need to determine safety and efficacy and share that with the community, there may not be uptake. So even if we have a vaccine that works extremely well, our communities may not accept them if we don't have a high quality process that demonstrates the safety and efficacy. And I am hopeful, optimistic that the FDA will follow their practices that enables that kind of trust. So we have eight candidate vaccines, potentially. Suppose more than one of them gets approved. How are we going to decide which ones to use? I suspect, Steve, that that's going to be a practical decision. In a perfect world, if you had eight, you'd compare all of their characteristics. You'd say this vaccine is best for this population. The risk-benefit analysis makes this one right for someone. The truth is that early on, there are likely to be very few doses of vaccine available. And I think that people will tend to use whichever one is available in the populations that make sense to vaccinate early. But I don't know initially where there's going to be that much choice. I think ultimately, if there are a number of vaccines available, and if the requirement for vaccination continues beyond an initial phase, where everyone's getting, say, annual vaccinations against SARS-CoV-2, then that would look different. It would look more market-like, more like influenza vaccines look right now, where there are a number of similar vaccines that have subtle differences, and those differences might make a difference. Their price may make a difference. Their convenience might make a difference. But for now, I think we aren't going to have all that much data to make those decisions. And I think we're just not going to have that much vaccine. I mean, Eric, I think you sort of raised that there may be different phases. The first phase, we should always follow the science and the data as to what it tells us. Early on, it'll be more limited for a smaller number of candidates. But the science should help inform us about what works, where and when. And hopefully all of the candidates will work and hopefully we'll know that quickly. And then there's a scalability issue separate even from the financial elements that you raise, Eric, which I hope does not turn out to be directive in any way that this becomes available to all at low to no cost. But it's scalability. And the point I tried to make earlier is do we need doses for 100 million people, 330 million people or 7 billion people and do we want to vaccinate people over seven years, seven months, or seven weeks? And what does that mean to breaking the back of transmission? Because transmission anywhere can spread everywhere. And I hope we have learned that as a community in the last eight months when this has gone from being newly discovered to being in all of our communities. But you know, as Dr. Pio mentioned in our chat with him a few weeks ago, Think of the scale. If you want to make a billion doses, how do you get a billion vials to put the doses in? How do you get a billion caps for the vials? 
How do you distribute them? Do they have different thermal or handling conditions? All sorts of questions that may intersect with the practicality, feasibility of rapid deployment. But I think in the early phase, which I think was in the next six to 12 months, if we have an effective vaccine or multiple effective vaccines, the data and the scalability are going to drive how rapidly we can deploy. Down the road, Eric, as you raised the durability question and questions have arisen about how protective is an immune response? What's the durability? Can people get second infections? Do we need to boost the immunity? All sorts of questions will come up and we'll have to, again, follow the science as to what those problems are and what tools we have to help solve them. But that will be part of getting this under control. The initial thing is we have to break the back of transmission, which is out of control in too many places. Yeah, I think, Lindsay, you raise important points about development that are really going to play a role in vaccine selection. So we have to produce a lot of doses over a relatively short time of perhaps multiple candidates, each one of which has different chemical characteristics and there are going to be different drivers for how difficult development is. I'd add one other thing in here. Some of the companies that are involved are very established in the vaccine business and have done this before. Some of them have never done it before. And some of the candidates like mRNA have never been used as a vaccine before. So there's going to be a lot of figuring out involved and it's not necessarily going to be so smooth. Absolutely, and as data emerge, Early data are imperfect, not cleaned, and not complete. And how we manage early data, and I'm just reflecting, Steve, on your comments about the EUAs, the emergency use authorizations over the last six months from hydroxychloroquine to remdesivir to convalescent plasma, and the different data sets they were based upon, the different acceptability to the scientific, medical, public health, and general community, and then the consequences when data emerge that suggest things don't work and how that impacts the trust and the acceptability. And so I think there will be a lot of confusion in this space. And your point, Eric, just about how companies figure out how to go to scale. It also will be how we as a community interpret data that come out not clean and pristine where the study is done final visits happen, data are complete, analyses are done and redone, and sensitivity analyses, and the kinds of things that give us confidence that the data have really been probed. Rather, we may get top-line results that get released as a press release, and then reactions occur by different communities, including public health and regulatory authorities. And the impact of that, when the data are incomplete and the best judgments are made on incomplete data, is that different decisions are made days, weeks, months later, and that can undermine the trust of the community and the acceptability when decisions vary over time as the data become more complete. I think we're gonna to have to be very careful stewards of data as a community to minimize the impact on trust as we push for transparency and manage uncertainty with early information that we're all gonna want but we have to understand early information is subject to revision as more complete data emerge. And that will be a real challenge. And the press release part of data sharing complicates our ability to practice medicine, albeit a good thing. I'm not saying it's bad that information is not released early, but we have to make sure that when it's released, it's in a format that's meaningful, transparent, and the community understands that revisions are possible as the data become more complete. I double down on that, Lindsay, that our ability to communicate with the public is critically important. No study is perfect. We try to get the data as good as possible to understand it as well as we can, but nothing is perfect. It's always incomplete, as you're suggesting, because you could do more. You could look at more subgroups and understand what's different about those different subgroups, which populations are going to benefit. There's a lot that goes into figuring out how well a vaccine is going to work and who's going to benefit the most from it. But we won't have those data. And I think that the press release culture going on right now is undermining trust by saying that everything is a big hit. And then later, more information comes out that modifies that statement. 
it really doesn't look like we know what we're doing. And I think we really want to communicate uncertainty. This is true in all of science and all of medicine. We need to do a better job of communicating uncertainty, saying, here's what we know. There are lots of things we don't know, and we're going to learn them. And as we learn them, we will reevaluate. And I, I think that message is very important. Speed, accuracy, balance. There's tensions between those forces. And I think we as a community, as a journal, as a scientific community, as clinicians taking care of patients, as members of the community trying to protect my health, my family's health, and my friend's health, how do we get information rapidly to make the best decisions, but that information being fair and balanced? And it's a real challenge. And I worry with the convalescent plasma story that we don't have all the data, or at least the data that's in the public domain are not clear as to the efficacy. And that becomes a real challenge as we as a community think about how to use it and as the agency has made judgments and how we as a community understand the strength and weaknesses of those judgments are just so important. And I hope with vaccines and new therapeutics, we maintain the standard bar of the agency of data establishing safety and efficacy, because that's so important for trust in the community. Yeah, I'd go a little farther, though, with the convalescent plasma. I think that we do have a lot of the data, not all of it. The FDA certainly has access more than we do, but we have a very good idea what that looks like. And it doesn't suggest that the interpretation that was expressed by the FDA is correct. This is just wrong. And I have to emphasize that convalescent plasma is a great idea. It has worked in other diseases. It could very well work here. But the data don't show us that. They don't show that it's safe. They don't show it's effective. Clearly just not. And there is a great danger to doing this. Two issues. One is it may not be safe nor effective. We just don't know. And we've imperiled our ability to test whether or not it is safe and effective. I can certainly see the same thing happening with vaccines, and it does worry me. And as you point out, Eric, not all treatments may work equally in everybody. Some treatments at some doses may be better for certain subgroups or populations than others, be it elderly, immunocompromised, with organ insufficiencies such as renal function and clearance, different genetic backgrounds, and the importance of defining that, so safety and efficacy, not just in toto, but realizing different groups may behave differently or respond differently to different treatments and the importance of teasing that out so we really can deliver the best treatment to our patients. You know, we've gone from personalized medicine, a real push in the last decade or two where we can find the treatment for you based on the genetics of your tumor or the antibiotic susceptibility of your bug, where we can target treatment for the problem you have to panaceas. This one treatment is good for everybody. And I think we all have realized it's not that simple and that we do need to do the science to understand who has side effects from plasma, whether it's heart failure or other kinds of side effects from the fluid load or the efficacy depending on the nature of the illness or the titer of the immune response in the donor. There may be different factors in both the donor and the recipient that may make some pairing or some scientific approach to optimize the engagement of the treatment with the patient versus one size fits all. And I think we've all realized that one size does not fit all in medicine. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Eric.